Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Transparency is the New Green in Product Selection and Specification. And joining me today is Michael Heinsdorf, VP of Partnerships at Avitru, to talk about the new partnership that our two companies have put together and the products and services that we're working on to make it easier for building professionals and for manufacturers, employees, and partners to find, understand, select, and specify products to construct higher performing, greener and healthier buildings. So you're at this webinar because we made some bold promises in the uh, promotion that we've done to date that we are bringing product transparency to the mainstream and bringing it to the attention of people in the industry outside of the traditional folks who have been interested in green building up until now. And we're gonna do that by making it easier to get visibility for the manufacturers uh, who have products and their brands in the catalog. We're gonna make it easier for people to get the specs for those products and to create specs that integrate their product transparency requirements into the specifications to help building professionals who wanna get those products into the buildings they're building to help them make that happen. And ultimately to get products and brands that are in the transparency catalog accessible through master spec. And we feel that making progress on all of these fronts will ultimately make a difference in the way products get selected and specified and purchased and will make a big difference uh, in the way buildings get built. So here's our agenda for today. Uh, Michael and I will do some introductions about each of our companies and what we're, we've been working on, what we will be working on. Then I'm gonna share with you uh, our story about how we've observed product transparency from its introduction in 2012 has moved from early adoption and into early mainstream. Then Michael's gonna to talk to you about master spec and product master spec solutions. And then it'll come back to me and we'll do a deep dive on the transparency catalog, what it is, how it works. We'll do a demo and a tour of a number of the manufacturers pages in the catalog. And then we'll come back and reiterate the solutions that we're working on together and leave time for Q&A. This webinar is being recorded and it will get posted after the webinar is over. Additionally, any questions that you have during the webinar, please put them into the questions panel. We'll get to them. And if we don't, for some reason, we will definitely follow up with you and, and get those questions answered. So I'd like to turn it over to Michael uh, to talk to us today about what's happening at Avitru. Thank you, Terry, and good afternoon or good morning to everyone, depending on where you are. Um, as you may know, I, I work for Avitru. I'm the Vice President of Business Development with a background in engineering. Um, Avitru used to be known as Arcom. Uh, we've changed, because, changed the name because we've changed our mission, what we're doing. I'll talk a little bit about that later, but just a couple things. We are the exclusive publisher of Master Spec, which is the AIA's specification system. Um, we employ uh, between 65 and 75 people, split between architects and engineers who maintain our content, and then we've got a whole IT software and support component that goes along with it. We've got about 900 plus specification sections, I believe, as of the first quarter of 2018. We we're at about 910, uh, with about 600 plus products, if you look at it at a fairly base level. Once you start looking at all sorts of different types of combinations, et cetera, that number goes up pretty significantly. It is the most widely used master guide specification in the United States. Um, and roughly what we say is about 80% of the ENR top 100 firms use master spec as the basis for their specifications. Um, and that's based on the 2016 list. Um, and one of the reasons we changed from Arcom to Avitru is we're really looking for a mission. Um, and part of our mission is we are committed to constructing a world where better building leads to better lives. I'll talk a little bit about that in a couple minutes. And thanks, Terry, back to you. I think most of you uh, who are on the webinar today are a little bit familiar with Sustainable Minds. I think 
Many of you may not be familiar with how we started the company. Ten years ago, bringing the very first LCA and eco-design software tool in the cloud created for product development teams in manufacturing organizations like your own to be able to start using lifecycle thinking in early stage product development to be able to understand the actual or the potential environmental impacts across the life cycle of products to make better design decisions early on. Uh, we were the first in the industry to bring life cycle thinking to product development teams and certainly the first uh, to do it in the cloud. Since the company has started, we've always had deep expertise in life cycle assessment. We've added that expertise in material ingredient analysis, and we've always had deep roots into customer experience and information design and the design of user-centered cloud software. About that LCA software, uh, we were really proud when we brought it to market with the help of Autodesk uh, to lend us that credibility to step into this world, just like we're really proud to step into the specification world with Avitru and, and MasterSpec, kind of the best names in the business. And that software that we created 10 years ago uh, has been used broadly both in industry, but also in education all around the world in every kind of uh, curriculum, business design and engineering, undergraduate, graduate, executive education, and even corporate training. So our roots and our commitment to education are, are very deep. So back in Green Build in 2017, so long ago, Michael and I attended a materials industry forum at Green Build put on by the AIA that Michael actually helped organize that brought together a group of manufacturers, a group of architects, engineers, and contractors, some software folks, some technical people to have this bigger discussion about what are the most urgent challenges in regards to product transparency and, and bringing it uh, forward and making it more, more mainstream. These were the top four things that came out of a combined discussion, which was number one, the need for product transparency education across the industry, not just to AECs, but also within manufacturers organizations, to their salespeople, their customer facing people, their product development people, Everyone needs this education. The second is making the standards easier to use. Uh, really the standardization of technical standards, both in the uh, environmental sector as well as in the material ingredient sector. And then not only standardizing the standards, but standardizing the results so that people can take those results, compare them, and make better informed uh, comparative decisions. The third was make it easy to find products with credible transparency information. And I was a little bit surprised to, to learn from the AEC group that they had the perception that there were not enough manufacturers who had products with transparency information. And you'll see that uh, we're going to demonstrate to you that we don't believe that that's the case. Um, and finally, uh, certainly from the manufacturer's uh, perspective, if you all are going to be investing in product transparency and responding to the market and learning about how you're making your products and where improvements can be made, uh, then it's understandable that manufacturers should get an ROI on that investment. If you're actually making higher performing products, those are the products that should be preferred and selected and built into the buildings that are getting built. So today we're going to talk to you about how Sustainable Minds and Avitru, uh, both individually and together, have been and will continue to address these most urgent challenges. So a little bit of backstory on, on product transparency. What are the primary drivers? And, uh, you know, it started in 2012 when the USGBC announced lead version four and said, look, you know, in lead version three, we had credits for uh, 
single attribute certifications for products in certain uh, segments, in addition to things like uh, recycled content and uh, distance from manufacturing to installation. But the emphasis in LEED has always been on uh, energy efficiency and energy in, in design, and that had traditionally been the definition of, of high performance. But with the introduction of product transparency as kind of the cornerstone for LEED version four saying, look, if a building is simply a compilation of products, uh, then you have to examine each of those products so that they add up to build a higher performing building. And the definition of performance uh, has been expanded to go beyond just energy efficiency or energy use to look at all of the inputs into the products that go into a building from cradle to grave, all the material ingredients. And the lead folks said, hey, we need a more technical way, a more scientific way for manufacturers to be understanding their own products, but also be, to be conveying uh, those results to the marketplace. So that's why we say transparency is the new green. That's our shorthand for telling that story. It's the next level. It's the step up. It's the new filter. And since LEED introduced LEED version 4, more rating systems have also uh, adopted product transparency credits and added them to their systems. And even some new rating systems have uh, come to fruition. But what it comes down to is that people are looking for products with disclosures, transparency disclosures, they're not simply looking for the disclosures. And we ask manufacturers, have you made it easy, if you've invested in product transparency, have you made it easy for people to find your products with transparency information? And then even more importantly, what will they learn about your manufacturing, your design and manufacturing processes, as well as those products? Because we believe that product transparency does build credibly greener brands, but not simply by producing disclosures. That the value for manufacturers to provide environmental information about products comes from demonstrating that you do actually understand what that information means and, and you know what you're doing. Ultimately, making better informed, greener, and healthier purchase decisions requires that that information be presented in a consistent understandable and meaningful way. And when that happens, you're building trust. Trust builds powerful brands and powerful brands create preference and value for their companies. So Sustainable Minds, since the introduction of product transparency for the last five years, has been kind of breaking down the product transparency challenges and focusing on year over year, solving some of the problems starting with making product transparency understandable and meaningful. Our first insight was if environmental performance and material health are simply part of a performance criteria and are being used to make selection, then that information should be found right alongside all the other information people use today to make decisions like functional performance, cost, aesthetic, safety, and it should be all in one place. So our big idea is to integrate product transparency into product marketing. And over the last five years, we've worked on making that content understandable and meaningful uh, by creating simplified cloud-based reports. We became a program operator to create a simplified, more standardized technical program for environmental declarations. Uh, we started the Program Operator Consortium with some of the other leading program operators in the industry. We created a standardized report for the material ingredient disclosures so that those results could be standardized. And in 2016, we launched the Transparency Catalog to start working on the findability problem. And last year, we introduced uh, making product transparency actionable so that people can find products, select them, get the specification information, and ultimately uh, get those products into the spec and, and into the building, and help manufacturers really get a measurable ROI on their product transparency investments 
by using product transparency as a powerful lead generation tool that really lets the user raise their hand because they're interested in your products with product transparency. And we'll be doing a demo of that just a little bit later. Um, because of the way we compile and curate the catalog and because of our expertise, we have a, a constant eye on every program operator and every material ingredient program. Uh, and when any manufacturer creates any new disclosure and does it for the first time, we add them to the catalog. And again, I'll show you that as well. So by the end of 2017, there were a total of over 1,200 uh, EPDs from all North American operators covering 19 of 35 CSI divisions uh, with uh, concrete and, and finishes being the uh, most popular divisions and finishes largely because there's, there's a lot of uh, big uh, sections within, within that division. There have been a number, you know, a ton of material ingredient disclosures, over 8,000 uh, in 27 of the 35 CSI divisions, and with the level certification being uh, the most popular because BIFMA has done a great job of getting their members to certify their products, followed closely by the Health Product Declaration, Declaration Collaborative and uh, Declare C2C and UL with their new uh, product lens with finishes and, and furnishings being the top category. So we're going to be publishing a trend report next month. It will be available uh, for free with a lot of background data and more stats on the progress of product transparency going from early adoption to early mainstream. But in terms of what did that look like, in the period of 14 months when we launched the catalog with the 350 brands in October, we actually launched at Greenbuild in 2016, there were only 350 brands who had invested in some kind of product transparency. By the end of December, roughly 14 months later, uh, there were 961 brands. That's three times the number of brands who invested in product transparency. Some only creating EPDs, some only creating material disclosures, and some having already invested in both. And we like to say, uh, this is actually a, a quote that I pulled out of an article that we recently posted into our product, in our LinkedIn group that we invite you to join, Transparency is the New Green, that product transparency really is no longer a fad or an early adoption. We believe it is in early mainstream. Um, hopefully everyone can see my screen. Uh, as I had mentioned before, we're, I'm just going to do a quick uh, overview of what is master spec. Then we'll talk a little bit about uh, sustainability language in master spec. Basically, what uh, sustainability design schemes master, se master spec supports and how to put that language into master spec. Um, how to use or interpret the sustainability language in master spec. And then we'll briefly discuss product master spec. Um, just a little background on master spec. As I mentioned, it's the AIA master guide specification system. So the AIA um, actually owns it and Avitru is a contractor that maintains, distributes and updates uh, the master spec system for the American Institute of Architects. Um, it will be 50 years old in 2019, uh, which we're pretty excited about and we'll have some announcements coming uh, later this year and then in 2019 to celebrate that I'm sure. Uh, so it's definitely been around for quite a while. The system has evolved significantly from uh, essentially a list of criteria and products um, down to basically um, what we have today, which is a uh, word and cloud based system. Um, we typically do at least 5000 hours of research into the products and materials that are specified within master spec um, among our content staff. We right now issue four updates a year, roughly quarterly. Um, as we move to a more of a cloud-based system, that probably will change at some point in time. It's fairly comprehensive for most architects and engineers that are involved in vertical construction with about 910 sections as of the first quarter of 2018. So that covers basically 
typically or, or on average about 80 to 90 percent of the products and materials that an architect or engineer would need for most typical buildings obviously we're not going to be able to have fairly specialized or fairly high-tech equipment um, with specialized we just don't necessarily always see the demand from um, for more than a project or two with high-tech equipment uh, specifically anything that involves computers um, or some sort of um, intellectual property with related to electronics it actually gets very difficult to maintain and update those specifications um, it is unique among the master guide specification systems in the u.s that we have a aia sponsored review committee there's actually three of them one for architects one for mechanical engineering and another for electrical engineering and the members of those are essentially a peer review who look at master spec uh, we follow the industry standard CSI three-part format, and I'll discuss that a little bit in a little bit. It is compatible, of course, with the AIA contract documents, but also with some changes to the front end with the uh, NSPE's system of contract documents, would be, which are the EJCDC documents. Um, and we've also found out that it is used by some government agencies, and with some changes, it is compatible with federal acquisition regulations. Uh, excuse me, I seem to have a, an issue with, uh, there we go. With respect to the content, as I mentioned, we follow CSI master format. Um, and I wanna make an important distinction here. Master format is a list of numbers and titles that is put out by the Construction Specifications Institute. And it's roughly a four to 500 page book with about 20 to 25,000 numbers and titles in it. There is not a one-to-one -one correlation between what is in master format and what is in master spec. Master format will tell you a number and title for a particular product, but as I mentioned, just because it's in master format does not mean it's in master spec. Um, we also follow what's called CSI section format, which is the three-part format. And again, I'll go back into that a little bit. Um, as I mentioned, master spec is developed and maintained by architects and professional engineers. We have a group internally, and then we uh, employ several consultants typically who are um, actively practicing architecture or engineering. Um, so, and then we coordinate all their activities with the review committees. Um, it is unbiased. And when I say unbiased, basically we try to put every single manufacturer on a level playing field for a particular product type. And we typically write a product or a product type to meet a minimum level of performance-based criteria. Uh, we coordinate master spec both among within the individual specification section also but also with the other technical specification sections and then division the division 00 and division 01 sections which have very very general criteria uh, master spec is generally performance or reference standard based that goes back to what i was saying about uh, being far compatible we can name certain uh, levels of performance within master spec and if you pull out that list of manufacturers, that is actually enough to go ahead and define a product and define the performance. Um, also, an important distinction for master spec is we like to specify within the system leading edge but not bleeding edge products. So we like to have products that are fairly current within the system, but we look for a, a certain level of use by our customers before we go ahead and put it in there. So a brand new product with absolutely no track record is more than likely not gonna get into master spec. If it's been out for a couple of years, it's generally accepted um, as being a good product by our review committees or it's recommended to us by more than one person. You know, We'll go ahead and take a look. Even if it's recommended by one person, we may go ahead, do some research, and then find out if it's a product that'll, that belongs in master spec because we like to specify a certain level of quality within master spec. With respect to sustainability, master spec currently supports LEED 2009, which is still used the most used sustainability design scheme within master spec. That's actually followed by LEED version four. We also support Green Globes, the International Green Construction Code, and actually 189.1. Um, we are currently working with the International Well Building Institute to incorporate the well building standard into master spec. Um, and we're looking at doing that in the first or second quarter of 2018. I wanted to hit a little bit again on the consistency. Um, as I mentioned, we try to be consistent within the 
specification section, the other section, specification sections that form master spec, and then the division zero and div division zero one sections. Um, how we do that is we actually have a pretty intensive process. Um, we've got our review committees, which I had mentioned. We have writers who coordinate with the review committees. And then basically once the review committees and the writers have agreed on what the changes to a specification section would be, um, we go ahead through a draft phase. The draft phase can be anywhere from um, a couple weeks to a couple months, at which point it gets reviewed by uh, hopefully at least one, if not a couple other people. Then we go through what we call a technical review. The technical review differs from the draft a little bit in that we're looking at it from a fairly pers technical perspective. We're asking the draft, we're making sure it just covers essentially the scope. Um, and then once we're done technical review, we go through what we call editorial review, which is essentially a group that looks at a specification section just from uh, the perspective of does it meet the criteria of the English language and the legal uh, criteria that we have set and try to maintain within master spec. One question we often get asked and I talked a little bit about this before, is what triggers an update? Um, the number one criteria really is user feedback at this point. Users can suggest products to us. We've got a, several different ways to do it, whether it's from within a specification section, emailing our help desk, uh, or giving us a call. There's several ways they can do that. We also take a look at standards, codes, references, federal mandates, um, any changes or updates to those. We'll see uh, something happen in master spec. On the federal side, we actually a couple years ago had a lot of changes that were made because of energy efficiency mandates by Congress. Um, we actually go and take a look at best practices. And again, we hear that from our users, whether it's the committees or someone who uh, emails us in or gives us a call and says, hey, we have a, a way of doing this. We also try to keep up with design trends. Um, while I mentioned technology is a little difficult for us to keep up with respect to product wise, we still try to maintain that within master spec. Um, we actually put cybersecurity requirements within master spec after 2014 because of the target hack that happened uh, through the HVAC section or HVAC system. Um, and then we also take a look at the age of a specification section. We try to keep them current within a couple of years. So when we talk about sustainability and specifications, you know, the idea is that we've got a project, let's say we want it to meet lead version four, um, and we're gonna specify basically at a very high level in division zero, zero and zero one, uh, general criteria that the project must meet for to meet lead version four. And then it's gonna be kind of an inverted pyramid as you get down to the technical sections, uh, as we get to product specific requirements to meet those criteria for lead version four. So typically you'll see in a sustainable design project, there's going to be a division one section. The one we use the most often is 018113, sustainable design requirements. It will have uh, typically some sort of dot one three, dot one six, uh, some sort of appendix to it. And that'll typically indicate what rating system that uh, you have to meet at that point. And it'll spell it out in the name too. So this could be sustainable design requirements for lead version four. And that, specification section at a very high level will specify the criteria that the project must meet in order to meet the lead version four uh, rating. Then you get to the, what we call the technical sections, which are divisions two through 50. And these are sections that talk about specific products. So in the case of drywall in division nine, there would be a specification section that would describe all the different types of drywall that can be within a project. And if you think about a typical office building, there can be several different types of drywall within a project. Some of those types of drywall may actually need uh, EPDs, some may not. There may be a couple different reasons for that, whether it's those products are not available with EPDs, or they may have already met the number of manufacturers and products that need to be specified within that project, and they were being fairly choosy about what uh, products they wanted to to be included within that that group of 20 to 30. Um, typically within a specification section, you're gonna see three parts. Part one is general, so that applies to all products and a specification section can have multiple products or a single product um, within the specification section. So those would be very general criteria that apply to anything that's specified within part two. 
there could be a separate submittal requirement um, just for sustainability. And I'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, and like I said, this is typically separate from a normal submittal, although sometimes it can be um, included within the normal submittal and maybe just checked off or uh, the architect or engineer would put a, you know, not reviewed for compliance with requirements stamp or some something like that just to indicate that they've gone ahead and reviewed it um, for compliance with the sustainability requirements. In part two, there are that's where the products are specified and it's typically on a per product basis. And as I mentioned, as part two could be for a single product, um, it could be for multiple products. And then part three is execution, which is essentially installation requirements. So when we take a look at part one for the submittal requirements, within master spec at least, we arrange all of our submittal requirements by topic. Um, we do not do it by rating system. It's because the topics are typically generally applicable across different rating systems. It's identifiable within master spec by a green hyperlink, which you can double click on. And when you double click, you open what we call sustainability builder. In this case, I've decided that I clicked on the uh, entry for EPDs and HPDs. I'm doing a lead version four product project. So I want to insert that language into the section. You hit insert, it inserts the language in there. And now I have the different types of submittals that I would need for a lead version four credit. Um, this again is going to apply to any product that's in part two of this specification section. And then there's an important distinction here in this case, in the case of the section we'll be looking at, it will only apply to certain products because we need to have those products indicated to have a sustainability uh, submittal, in this case, an EPD. Um, in this case, I can choose between EPD, HPD, or a uh, sourcing of raw materials requirement. Just for uh, theoretical use, I'm gonna say I want the EPD here. Then I'm gonna take a look at part two. And in this case, like I mentioned, we've got many different types of gypsum wallboard. Um, in this case, I just want the generic one to have a sustainability submittal. So I've said, yes, I want this particular product to have a sustainability submittal. Um, and that's going to be a separate submittal, possibly. Or if we had talked about it in Division 1 as the uh, same submittal being acceptable, that would also be acceptable by the architect or engineer. So that's why you've got to coordinate the Division 1 and then the individual technical sections. Very quickly, wanted to talk about product master spec. This is a free mat free section. Um, and it's free for architects or engineers to use either from within master spec or to download from productmasterspec.com. It's customized for a particular manufacturer um, and product or products that that manufacturer makes. Um, as I said, we've got a, it's free for the architect or engineer to download and you can get it from both within master spec or from productmasterspec.com. Right now we've got over about 600 specification sections. Um, and when a manufacturer, when an architect or engineer is within uh, what we call paragraph builder, which is a way to include certain manufacturers for a particular product. In this case, uh, I pulled up the paragraph builder window for gypsum board type X. These are the different manufacturers that a architect or engineer can choose for gypsum board. But in the case of USG here, they also have the option to go ahead and download a product master spec. We're going to be rolling out uh, what we're doing with Sustainable Minds to find products that have EPDs or HPDs through Product Master Spec first. At some point in the near future, when you take a look at the Resources tab, if there is a, uh, a sustainability submittal that would be available or sustainability information that would be available from Sustainable Minds, it will be available through the Resources tab or drop down. Um, and one important distinction, if you're a master spec user um, or subscriber, they have the ability to download what we call a track changes version where we show all the changes that we've made to the specification section, everything that's available online uh, through productmasterspec.com is just a clean version. There's nothing to indicate what's been changed. Um, and with that, it's back to you, Terry. Thank you, Michael. So Michael and I both want to reiterate, we are at the beginning of our relationship and we have put our arms around a scope of work that we think uh, 
there's some low hanging fruit, and then there's some, you know, pretty gnarly longer term issues uh, that we're going to be working on to bring these two kinds of data together to uh, make the workflow that uh, select people who do selection as well as the people who do specification simpler, easier, more streamlined. And you know we're, we're acutely aware that uh, those are two different kinds of people in two different stages of, of the design process. And so there's a lot of kind of parsing and thinking through uh, how to integrate products and data and how to prioritize. So I mentioned that Sustainable Minds is a, a customer-centered product development organization. Uh, we build every new product working with not only uh, manufacturing customers, but always with uh, AEC folks as well, so that we are uh, taking requirements and validating uh, use cases to create the best user experience, which is why the transparency catalog is an educational marketing and customer service platform. It is not a product database. And I'm going to emphasize that in a couple places because we understood that people didn't need another product database. Because of the greatest challenges that I mentioned earlier, people need education, they need better marketing, and they need to be able to deliver better customer service and support. And yes, there is a database of products, but the user experience was not designed uh, to be like a product database. Now, you'll see in the functionality that later this year, we will be adding some database-like capabilities of searching and filtering, but we didn't feel that was the best user experience to be offering out of the gate in the first year because there's nothing worse than putting in a search into a product database and getting either poor results or no results. Uh, and so our focus is entirely on the brands. We want to be rewarding all of the manufacturers who have invested a little or a lot in product transparency because of the time and risk and value, all of the things that manufacturers have had to get over to uh, respond to this uh, market request. And so by having a catalog just of the brands who have invested in product transparency and only those products from those brands that have transparency disclosures means there's a meta filter over the entire catalog. And I'll show you how we have a rating systems page. Every product that's in the catalog meets one or more of the requirements uh, for all of the green building rating systems that accept product transparency simply by virtue of being in the catalog. All the education and marketing tools are built in. There's no sponsored content, no ads. We want manufacturers to be able to tell their own stories. We want the business model to be simple. That's part of a great user experience for our customers is simplicity both in use as well as in doing business with us. Everything is being developed in a standardized way, so information gets delivered in a standardized way. And our business model is that it is always free to use. Anybody who wants to use the catalog, whether they are an AEC or they work for a manufacturer or a partner, it's always free to use. And we really rigorously protect data privacy and user privacy. Uh, it's not one of those business models where uh, manufacturers have access to user data or manufacturers' data and usage data is going to get sold to any third party. That's not our model. We have a simple model. We sell an annual subscription to manufacturers with packages of education and marketing tools, and it's super simple, and we'll go into that. We are... Uh, already have a, a great set of partners with CHIPS and the Program Operator Consortium and MasterSpec. And I uh, think we're really uh, set up to help move product transparency into uh, early mainstream and, and beyond. Because we're addressing the challenges faced by both sets of constituents, which is that uh, AECs are challenged with finding products with disclosures, as we learned uh, at that 
green build session. And when they do find those products and those disclosures, they're challenged with using them to make better informed decisions. They're, they're technical disclosures. And manufacturers uh, have a whole range of challenges. Those manufacturers who got going early, uh, now that it's into early mainstream, just having disclosures is potentially no longer a competitive advantage, particularly in those CSI divisions where there are many manufacturers already engaged. There are also the challenges of connecting the dots between that investment in product transparency and sales. Now that product transparency is a thing, it's not going away. So uh, the time it takes to create disclosures, do the research, get the data, create the disclosures, train sales and marketing organizations how to talk about it, how to distribute those disclosures, all those things need to be operationalized so it's efficient and effective so that manufacturers can support the AEC community in finding what they need and ultimately being able to leverage all the activities that they're doing to build a, a credibly uh, greener and healthier brand. But it turns out that research shows that most architects in early design will go to a manufacturer's website first to do research on products. And so that's part of what informed the design of the catalog, which is, look, we wanna help manufacturers get their products found no matter if somebody goes to their website first or goes to a place like the transparency catalog. Either way, they come to the catalog, we're ultimately driving people back to the manufacturer's website because that's why manufacturers have websites. They want to do business with people there. And when they come to the manufacturer's website, if they can't find those products with transparency information easily, we help the manufacturer direct people to their page in the catalog, which sends them back uh, to their website. So again, the focus is on brands. We want people to learn about the brands who have stepped up. But again, this emphasis on uh, creating awareness and preference for those, brand, those products that really are higher performing and that will achieve what we're all looking for, which is to reduce the impacts from the built environment on the natural environment and, and human health. So as a mission-based company, this catalog is designed to ultimately achieve that mission. So you can see there's this virtuous cycle of supply and demand uh, that it all has to work together. So the catalog is designed to provide a great deal of benefit to both constituencies for manufacturers to save time and money in sales and marketing, improve the effectiveness of efforts, and deliver an ROI. And for building professionals to be able to find everything in one place, make it easy, make it understandable. What do these disclosures mean and how do they get used to earn credits in the green building rating systems? Learn about what a manufacturer is actually doing to improve uh, be able to share feedback, really leverage the network effects of being in the cloud, and ultimately reward manufacturers. And if all of this happens, then everybody is participating in creating this change uh, that we all aspire to, to create. I'm going to give you an overview of the, the elements of the catalog, and then I'm going to dive in and, and do a demo and illustrate e each of these elements. And I want to start with the featured brand. The featured brand are the brands who really have uh, created a lot of content about what their disclosures mean, what they're doing to improve, and putting it all together using one or more of our transparency products that are next generation marketing tools that integrate product transparency into product marketing. So everything somebody needs to make an informed decision is, is literally all in one place but made understandable and meaningful and provides the manufacturer the ability to tell the stories uh, that there's no place to tell in a disclosure and really no place to tell in, in a traditional uh, brochure. Those featured brand manufacturers uh, set up a brand showroom and all of the products with transparency information are displayed in that showroom and when uh, you click on any of those products, you're going to get to one or more of 
the different types of transparency products. And I'm going to show you the newest component that we've added, which is the project builder, configurator, and library. These are our transparency products. Again, it's all in the cloud. It's all a standardized format that takes those transparency disclosures and integrates it into marketing. Knopf uh, was our strategic customer in developing the project builder, configurator, and library. It's an optional module that featured brands can add to their showroom, um, but it really is the first time uh, that a manufacturer can leverage those investments in product transparency where people coming to find those products will be able to select them, build projects, save them in a project library, and actually configure the project, the products specific to a project so that they're keeping track of what those requirements are for a particular project. It can be an example project for a category of products that they often uh, build and, and create specifications for. Um, but the key point is that this allows the users, the AECs, to be able to contact the manufacturer when they really are uh, ready to get some help whether it's specification help or if it's a facility manager or a contractor, someone who can make a purchase decision, they can request a quote and already have gone through the selection and as much of the configuration process as possible. So it really is getting uh, inbound leads with complete privacy for the user and only when they raise their hand and they're ready for some help uh, do they reach out to the contractor, sorry, to the manufacturer, who then can really deliver better, more efficient uh, customer service and support. Our standard uh, presentation for a brand uh, is in this one page uh, presentation of the brand and all of their products. And now is a good time for me to uh, jump in and go to the demo. So, Here's the transparency catalog, and uh, I'm going to start by um, showing you some of those standard brand pages, and I'm going to show you first the Owens Corning brand page, just launched yesterday, and it also turns out that Owens Corning has product master specs. So right here you can see that uh, I come to the page. That logo links to the Owens Corning website. Uh, there's a standard opening statement about their commitment to transparency. Uh, every manufacturer has a choice of providing a contact link, a phone number, any, any combination. Um, and because Owens Corning has uh, product master specs, I can go right there and, uh, and get the spec. Now, if I had if I'm a user and I went to product master spec and I got those free product master spec sections that Michael mentioned, and I went to the Owens Corning page, I would also see that Owens Corning has products in the transparency catalog. And that's going to take me right, right back to the page. Now, you won't be surprised to learn that uh, there are a number of manufacturers who are both in the transparency catalog and have product master specs. Uh, but what's interesting is to see that there uh, is not a one-to-one -one correlation of products with transparency information to product master specs. And largely, that's uh, an organizational uh, discovery uh, that it's not typically the same people in an organization who are responsible for specifications, who are also responsible for, for product transparency. So now there's this opportunity to bring those uh, people in an organization together to really start to leverage those investments and now get that content uh, in, into a new place. And so I want to show you, uh, here's a listing, you know, in a glance, I can, I can click, I can see uh, more, get more information about that, that product specifically. Um, but what I can see is all of the CSI master format divisions that Owens Corning has products in. Uh, and I can see what disclosures they have. And you can see that they've got both EPDs and material ingredient disclosures for some products in some divisions. 
And I can click right there and uh, go directly to those uh, disclosures. And in some, they have just EPDs. And I think uh, in some, they might have just material ingredient disclosures. Yep, they do that for the mineral board insulation. But what I want to do is I want to show you some of the other listings because these are all standardized pages but are infinitely customizable uh, for each manufacturer's product transparency investment. So uh, let's just take a quick look at Excel Dryer. Excel Dryer uh, did one EPD for three of their products. And I want to bring your attention to the fact that it's very difficult for a user to pick up an EPD or even an HPD or declare label and figure out how many products from the manufacturer that disclosure covers. In the transparency catalog, this is literally the opportunity to take the one or two or three disclosures that you've created and correlate it to the potential 10, 20, 30, 40, 100 products that it covers so that the user literally can see in one place the listing of all the products uh, that you have. I'm going to show you the Tarquette listing. Here's a completely different uh, structure where uh, it was Tarquette's intent and is their intent to try to bring all of their brands under one umbrella and allow their customers and people inside their company to find all of their information uh, about their products all in one place. So now I can see the different CSI master format divisions with the brand name or product name appended to it. You can see there's multiple uh, sections of resilient tile flooring, for example, and I can see what they have from Tandis and what they have uh, from Johnsonite. Um, so a user can browse by section or you can open it all. This particular listing has over 800 products all in one place, all uh, on, on one page. Again, uh, where the user can click on the product name or the disclosures and, and in a glance uh, see what they have. I uh, wanted to show you a couple others, again, to show you the customizability. Uh, here's Stego Industries. Stego only has material ingredient disclosures. They've got HPDs. We've got an, uh, a lot of built-in content to help people understand uh, what, what this stuff means. And uh, again, just wanted to show you a, a range of, of uh, different kinds of manufacturers. Here's Clark Dietrich, uh, also a product master spec customer uh, who has invested significantly uh, in both environmental disclosures and material ingredient disclosures and have done that for every one of the products in the catalog. Uh, but that said, let's go to the product master spec page, not a correlation one-to-one -one of specs uh, to products with transparency information. So there's a big opportunity for uh, all manufacturers to start thinking about how that investment can uh, be further, further leveraged. One of the, the most powerful things in the listing is are these social media tools where you get to think about how easy it is for a manufacturer to send that information to anyone uh, inbound who requests, hey, do you have a product with disclosures, yes or no? Anybody can go to this link. Uh, this is customized for the manufacturer. It's part of the listing subscription. And it generates an email with the link to the listing telling the user, hey, go here. You can find all of our products, not just one. No more emailing around. Uh, PDFs, um, and same thing for these other social media tools, the Twitter, it's all built in, Facebook, LinkedIn, you have a customized social media campaign all, all right there. I want to go back to the featured brands and uh, jump into the Knopf Project Builder, which I had mentioned. Here's their brand showroom. We've added the new builder and configurator. So now a user can uh, select by uh, application type if they want some help with that. Then they can learn about this 
type of uh, insulation. This is a transparency report. This is an EPD. Uh, it's in three pages. It includes all of the life cycle impact information made understandable. It includes the material health information also made understandable. And finally, it includes all the stories about what Knopf is doing to uh, improve its products. If I want to now start a project and uh, specify that particular kind of insulation, I can start a project. I can see that uh, the jet stream is already there. The only time anybody logs into the catalog uh, is to create their own project library. And the only thing required to set up a project library is a username and a password. We don't ask any other information. Uh, it's literally just about technically setting up the capability uh, for you to save products and projects. So I'm going to show you um, in my project library when you set it up, uh, you get an example project. And you can see uh, here's a number of products that have been selected and, and configured. I can always uh, add more. Um, and again, configure those products to be specific to the project that I'm working on. I can download the project and all of the disclosures that are included in that project and an overview come with it. That makes it easy to uh, submit your green building rating system submittals. But here's the thing that I was talking about earlier. Not only do I have access to all of the specifications right, right there, but now that user can contact the manufacturer, can contact Knopf if they want some spec help or if they'd like to request a quote. And now this quote request will go in and it can be integrated into your Salesforce implementation, go to an individual person. It, again, it's all customized. And all the products that they've selected with the configuration goes with it. To wrap up uh, talking about the catalog expressly, our business model is just annual subscriptions. And a whole bunch of stuff comes with each annual subscription for a standard or a featured brand. All the education and marketing uh, is built in. We've got uh, increasing visibility and reach to all kinds of building professionals. But we like to say the highest value users in year one for a manufacturer are your own internal and external stakeholders who really need that education to help you sell your products, market and sell your products um, more efficiently. Now we know that manufacturers have a choice of places where their products can be found. And so we have a little bit of a framework to help you think about how do you choose from what problems do each of those solutions solve? What's the business model for each of those organizations? What expertise do they have on staff? What's the customer experience like? We talk with a lot of manufacturers who have products in other resources who have never tried it themselves to use and find products, which is kind of surprising. Um, you know, how are you measuring results? And finally, how do people choose the tools that they use? And it comes down to what they believe about the brand and the user experience that gets delivered. And every manufacturer we work with, we go through this value proposition and ROI framework to help you figure out uh, the answer to, to those questions. So to wrap it up, Avitra and Sustainable Minds are really working on making it easier to get visibility, get your products into the specs, help people learn more about your products, and ultimately get your products to be selectable through master spec. We have already implemented the bi-directional links We'll be working on the new specification language beyond what Michael showed you, and we will help get the people in your organizations together to understand that integration. And we're working hard to address these top challenges and feel that we have made inroads and will continue to do so. So that's our webinar for today. 
uh, we got some questions in. We answered some. Uh, I know this was a information intensive uh, presentation. So we'd like to thank you for taking the hour today. Um, Michael and I will certainly follow up with anybody who has put in a question that hasn't been answered. And we have an exit survey. If you have some time to take it on your way out, the last question in the survey is your ability to give us some feedback, ask any more questions, and make sure that uh, we've met your expectations for having spent an hour with us. So we'd like to thank you for coming. Michael, thank you so much for uh, putting this relationship together with us and working hard like we have been since it's been kicked off. Uh, well, thank you, Terry, and thank you, everyone, for your time today. Really appreciate it. All right. Have a great day, everyone.